a couple of words we need to restart hello okay uh, a couple of words about fundamentals <clears throat> uh, in general about human computer interaction and something about human centered AI. I'm sorry for the two of you that already have heard part of these things in the human computer interaction course and the others that maybe knows them already uh, like 50 minutes on this part so um, human computer interaction and AI are considered two subfields of computer science in, um, in a larger sense and since the, the beginning they had some sort of love-hate relationship um, and there was since you know 2009 some effort to say but if you can be able to work together then maybe something good will happen not just focusing on the human parts and not just focusing on the uh, algorithmic part but try to make user interface a little less stupid and frustrating than they are today uh, and this was something that was said again in 2009 but it can also be said probably at periodically over time um, and so human AI interaction means also as a way to try to merge and to bridge these two fields. Um, so let me start saying what is human computer interaction, however. Um, so human computer interaction is a multidisciplinary field by definition, was born at the intersection of computer science, psychology, and design. Um, and it's concerned with the design, and then it's evolved over time. And it's concerned with the design, evaluation, and realization of interacting computing system for human use in general, and with the study of the major phenomena that are surrounding them. So not just creating things, but also understanding why we need to create those things and which is the impact of those things on people, work, society, etc. And as the name say, involve two entities: the human and the computer. Uh, that determines each other behavior over time. So the person wants to do something with the computer and the computer will provide an output and the person will evaluate if the, per the, the output is something that is coherent with the goal and they will proceed in this um, interaction between the two. And here in picture there are uh, two artifacts that came up from the field, let's say, quite a lot of years ago. Uh, do you recognize them? What's the first one on the top? It's a mouse. Yes, it's the first version of the mouse. Um, and was presented in a, a video that you should probably look on YouTube or whatever uh, that's called the mother of all demos. That's called like that. The, 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 mo the video wasn't called that way, but after was called the mother of all demos because it was so well done for a demo that that got those names. And in that video, um, it was also presented the mouse, but not just the mouse. It was like 1940, something like that. The second one, the second one is a little bit difficult, I think. It's, it's undrawn of. It's something that remember a tablet. So it's, let's say, we can say that tablets uh, started from this idea hmm? that was made way long before the creation of tablets at Park in California by Alan Kay that was focusing on giving tools to people to young people, especially to children, to learn better and so to use the computer as a tool to learning and to, with, with some fun, etc., as a way to learn something and giving this portable computer with a screen where you can write, you can read and there's a keyboard was something that it could have been enabled this, um, this, this vision and this goal, clearly not in those time at that moment, uh, but uh, later on, many say the tablets basically get inspiration from this 
idea. Alan Kay is also one of the person that create was in the team that created object-oriented programming, like the definition of object-oriented programming. A lot of things happened in Park, Axios Park, in those years, including these things here. Um, so, we what since the name human computer interaction as human and computer as two entities, and then there is interaction. Uh, we said, and it's also in the human AI interaction. What is interaction? Interaction can be defined in many many different ways. But the sum of it is that is not the idea of a computer and a person that are engaged in some way doing some activities, but it's uh, again something that concerns humans and computer. So we also when we speak human AI interaction, something that concerns humans and an AI based system that determine each other behavior over time. And this mutual determination can be of many type including statistical, mechanical, structural, cognitive, whatever. So if you are thinking about neurodiverse population, that's, it's a kind of mutual determination because the human in that case will react differently. If we are speaking about mixed reality, that will be something else in the way in which this determination happens and what the person can do and the person can perceive. If we think about the graphical user interface, it will be again something different with uh, typically developed people. Hmm? So the matrix for interaction is always users, so people that have some goals and some pursuits in mind. I want to do some activity, I want to reach a goal by doing some task. That's the purpose, the matrix of interaction. How well the system supports me in fulfilling that goal, or how much well the system replaces me in fulfilling that goal. Hmm? But still, how much my goal as a person is fulfilled by such a system, could be intelligent or not. Um, and in the field, we should have some clarification. So uh, we said already that the person wants to accomplish some goal in a specific domain. And clearly, each domain has very specific jargon. And I think you are a good example of this because if I need to create a user interface, whatever it is, vocal, graphical, virtual reality, augmented reality, a game, whatever, every domain in which I apply those interface has a specific jargon and set of processes, goals, artifacts, etc. If I'm doing maintenance in a tunnel, it will be different terminology, I suppose, than if I'm doing some with virtual with augmented reality, then I would do educational virtual reality, augmented reality with children in a classroom. Different people involved, different terminology, different domain in which I can speak. If I go in the medical setting, I will need to maybe to, to know medical terminology and not just speak about random other generic terms that maybe you can apply in other domain. Hmm? So, I want, as a person, as a user of a generic system, to accomplish a goal in a domain. And that domain gives us the context to understand which are the characteristics of this topic. And the tasks are the action that the person can do to manipulate the concept of the domain. And clearly the goal is realized once you perform one or more of these tasks. And again, interaction studies the relation in that sense, as we said before, between the user and the system. And as a consequence of all of this that I said, the system possesses a state and speak its own language. That's the language of the system. And the person possesses each also state. And an understand that includes an understanding of the system state, uh, some intention to perform a task, and it speaks its own language. Trouble happens when the two languages are not aligned. Trouble happens when this understanding of the system state is not actual the system state. So I'm understanding that something works in a way, but it's not actually working that way. But my understanding of the thing is that one, as this could be, as we said before, expectation, but not only. And I clearly need to, to want to use um, a system, whatever it is, to do something, you know, just to, to look at it, to, to reach a goal hmm, in some way. Um, and one way, it's one classical way, I will just 
How many of you know about this? Have ever seen about this, except the one that looked at the human interaction, of course. Okay. Um, so what is this? It's one simple model that describes, from a let's say psychological perspective, how a person interacts with the system when it has a goal, so becomes a user of a system. And this is a model by Don Norman uh, that he presented this model in the in a book that's called The Design of Everything Everyday Things. And in Italian is La Caffettiera del Masochista, because of the picture that is on the book. Um, and it's described how we immediately, instantly, interact with any system. It doesn't matter if it's computer system, AI system or not. What Norman say is uh, that the person has a goal and wants to execute something in a system, providing the inputs of the system, using the inputs of the system. And in this execution, it forms the opinion, it forms the, the steps to do the things before actually doing the stuff. And the system, as a reaction of this um, input, provides some output that the user needs to evaluate, to understand, and use it to decide if they need to continue the execution or not. And, and I'm not going into much detail, but basically there are these several uh, sequence of steps that we are instantly, immediately doing. So we establish a goal, I want to do this, and I form an intention, I specify the action to reach the goal, and then I executing the action, and then the system will uh, provide me um, an answer that I will perceive as a state, I interpret the state, and I will evaluate the state, understand if I need to do any other action or not. And clearly the system speaks its own language, and the user speaks its own language, and the two, again, can, can be, should be aligned in some way. And Norman also say that the difference between how harder, how distant are the two languages, and how distant are for the user, how difficult it is for the user to realize, execute his intention that the person say is in own word is what creates this gulf, one of the execution, one of the evaluation on the other side, and bigger are the gulf, the harder is the, um, the interaction between the person and a system. Um, let's make a, an example now here. Without a computer system, let's use the door. So I want to go out. What do I need to do from here? What do I need to do? Walk to the door. And? And push the lever and? More the door and then walk, walk out. OK. So what's the goal? Go out of this room. Um, what's are my intention? My intention is going out of the room through the door, not through, not through the other one, for instance, right? And which is my action sequ sequence, what you said. I go there, I press the handle, and I open more the door and go out, and then I can execute the action. How do we know if uh, this is working? Yes, let's say that without using affordances. <laughs> you don't know. You have to try. No, uh, after we try, how do we know that we succeed? Well, I, I open the door. Well, first, I, I'm, I'm able to reach the door. That's the first thing. I, I can reach the door, but if you put something in the middle, or if I'm here on a wheelchair, there is no way I can reach the door um, alone without help. So uh, then I go there, I press the handle and the door opens. So that's the feedback that doors give to me that opens and then I can go out. Uh, and so if I go there, press the door and the door doesn't open, what means? Did I made something wrong? The answer is no. <laughs> 
The answer is no. Um, for the affordances that you said before. Um, Maybe the door was closed by... There is a problem with the door. That's the, the answer. <laughs> the normal answer is there is a problem with the door. How many times you went in front of a door and pushed instead of pulling the door? It happens. And it's your fault? And the answer is still no. It's the affordance of the door that is misleading according to your experience. In a way, that is the language of the law. Hmm? The law is communicating push, but it should communicate in pull. And your understanding of the door is that you should pull, but instead you should push. Hmm? So this increased the goal of evaluation or execution, clearly, because you want to do an action, you have a goal, you want to have a sequence of steps, you have an intention, you're going there to execute a step, but it's not working because of your understanding of the door system is different from what is designed from the actual state of the door. Hmm? Or another example, you said before, I cannot open because it's locked. That is, I understand the door as not locked, but I go there and I push and it's locked. That could not happen with those doors, right? Because these are emergency doors, so they cannot be locked from, from the inside at least from the outside maybe. So if there's an emergency door and it's locked, it is is a problem because that's an emergency door, it should not be locked. So my understanding of the state of the door is, um, is wrong because the door is not giving me, is not expressing the state correctly according to the picture, the, the affordances that he has, it has. Right? So this is an example, but you can imagine the same. I, I use the example of the door because it's everybody went through a door and tried to push instead of pull. That's a common thing. Uh, but you can think the same process also with other things. I want to log in a website. I want to do anything. Hmm? So this is a conceptual model how we behave individually in front of any system. Hmm? Um, so in, in human computer interaction or human-centered AI also, we typically have uh, the, the field deploy a different type of perspective in which um, differently from other, let's say, subfield of computer science, computer engineers specifically, where technology is an end. We want to do an algorithm for X. We want to improve the algorithm for X. Um, in this field, the technology is a mean to reach an end, where the end is satisfying user needs, satisfying attitude, satisfy a goal, satisfy expectation, etc. So in a way, people first and at the center, starting from people. So that's why it's people fault. The default answer is no, because it's the system that is not well designed for supporting people. And then people can make mistakes anyway, but the first check is, is the system designed properly and is communicating properly or not? Um, so there are some main concepts that we can just keep in mind. One is clearly usefulness. So to be able to accomplish what is required, expected. One is usability that in very short term is to do it easily and without thinking too much on what I'm doing. Again, if you go in front of the door and you want to open it, how much do you think what you need to do? Zero. You instinctively go there and push. Because you have learned through experience that is something you can push. Right? So that is, don't let me think. I, I, I know how to use it without instruction. We said before, uh, maybe with 1,000 page manual I can, I can use that terrible user interface. We, don't, we shouldn't need manual to use user interface. We should be able to use it without too many explanation. If it's not in a specific domain, like I'm learning how to fly an airplane, I clearly need training to do that because it's a specific domain. Um, another attribute is performance, robustness, also attractiveness and engagement are attributes to consider. So it's not only is usable and is, uh, is is useful, but also it has good performance, it's robust enough, is attractive and engage me, engaging for me. And these are key attributes. And uh, one thing that the field uh, does and that we want to be able to, 
to go in detail here, but this is generic for human computer interaction. It has uh, two things, uh, actually three things, um, understanding people and their needs. That is what we said before with the doctors in the hospital. If the researcher went there and looked for how they use the X-ray that would have solved, bring the algorithm in a different direction. They go there, understand people, understand practices, understand needs of people and proceeding on that. Um, then you can also analyze behavior using technology, collecting data, gathering patterns, etc. And also you can understand how the design solution, how the products, how the prototype, how the algorithm, how the system affects people's perception, attitudes and judgment. When we put technology in a domain where technology is not present, we are affecting people's perception, attitude and judgment about that um, domain and this action by the simple fact of adding technology. And so we should also understand how this affects people, not to, including, as he was saying before, under the ethical perspective. Hmm? So these are two concepts uh, of the field. So what this means, it would mean that we want to uh, typically early focus on people and their task. Again, as in the case of the, um, of the doctors in that hospital, observing people doing their work, and involving them in the design process of the system reduce uh, problems and make things more effective. Um, we can also use evaluation not only numerical in terms of precision recalls, but as he was saying before, we had a result, we, look, we have an expert that is looking at those results, then there could be also something that uh, we can use as for a general evaluation. So we, we have done something and we invite people to try, we collect metrics, qualitative and quantitative metrics, and then we can see how people behave in a way, and, and we want to do it in a way that is iterative as much as possible. So we don't want to start collecting information, spend one year to create something and that's it, but ideally we would like to collect information, start doing something, version 0 0.1, and then maybe getting a feedback from the population that is going to use it about that piece of technology and then realize version 0 0.5, maybe, and get collected information and proceed towards the final version uh, of, the, of the things. These three things, early focus on people and task, evaluation that is based on people and iterative design, um, it's as a benefits more safety typically more ethical products not always uh, more innovation and a higher ROI if it's in a more management perspective mm -hmm. so return on investment and this is proved by I, I didn't add here any reference but this is proved in the literature and in the uh, industrial practice as well mm -hmm. so benefits in this human center approach are many and human-centered AI, that is one of the two disciplines I mentioned before, together with explainable AI, is something that tries to focus on amplifying, augmenting, and enhancing, and try to remember these three terms, um, human performance in a way that AI system can be more safe, reliable, and trustworthy. So in a way to increase reliability, safety, and trust of the entire system. So just, not just, but including this human-centered approach that has the benefit as before, can potentially make the AI system more reliable, safe, and trustworthy. And so the shift that um, Ben Schneiderman in 2020 was advocating when he was introducing this, this field of human-centered AI was to shift from measuring only the algorithmic performances in terms of recall, precision, etc to include also, not only, but also human performance and satisfaction with this human-centered a participant approach that I mentioned before will allow to make, again, better AI system. And he wrote this, I don't know, many pages to prove this. And we will also cover this briefly next class. So the change 
that human-centered AI wants to bring is that instead of putting much focus on the algorithm and see humans as an afterthought, as we have seen many machine learning courses does, and it's fine that they do this because they also need to, to explain what to do in terms of algorithms, uh, is to put the goal, the human, at the center and using AI uh, around to support, to augment, to facilitate the goal and the task of the humans. So bringing human more center, since, as we said before, human are in every step of the process. This was very quick foundational um, introduction to, to these topics, um, just to give you an idea of the main terminology and the main ideas, quick, almost half an hour. Um, any question about this? This clearly intersect with human interaction, of which some of you did a course, some of you knows about from other courses. For instance, if you speak about affordances, something you probably should know. Okay, so this close these uh, fundamentals. We will receive something like the human-centered AI in the next class with more depth. Let's speak about the exercise for tomorrow and then we will close. So, not tomorrow, Friday. So for Friday, we will do panels in the first half of the class, so 9 to 11. Um, and we will have two panels on two different topics. Uh, do you know what is a panel? So, a panel, by definition, is a discussion, a public debate in front of an audience. So when you see panel, typically you see some expert lying, down, lying somewhere in a room that share opinions, sometimes opinion on one side versus another side, not always. And then there are, there is a moderator that is moderating the session and give, you have three minutes to speak, now is not your turn, or this question is for you, etc., etc. And you have an audience. An audience that is expected to ask questions to the panelists to understand uh, better their position and to get knowledge from what they say. Then if you go to a panel in a conference, what typically have happened is that the panelists speak and the audience doesn't. Uh, but we, we will try to make it more realistic to the, to the definition, that is, it's half and half. It's not just panel speaking and the other not doing anything, but it's an interaction also in that way between the two parts. So we will have in these two panels some panelists, you, uh, a moderator, me, and an audience, you. So, you will be required to participate in both panels. In one, you will be the panelist. And in the other one, you switch and go to the audience. So, panelists for each panel will have around 30 minutes overall to present themselves and express their position. And the audience will have another half an hour at the end of the panelist presentation to make question to one or more panelists. That means that if you are acting a panelist, so when you are acting a panelist, you will need to prepare what they, you are going to say and what's your position for a couple of minutes. And when you're acting an audience, you need to have at least two questions for each to ask the panelist for. So, how to prepare panelist? Read the paper associated to the panel. And I will show you which are and when you are panelist. Then take a stance. So the first panel is about automation versus augmentation. Take a stance. Which side you prefer most or entirely? Take a position in that debate. And then create three slides to support your position, possibly with a link to some research interest of yours. It's not mandatory, but if there is the link, it's better. 
And these three slides are something you will need to deliver, not something you will need to project in the class. But you can use them to, to, to work as panelists on your own laptop. Audience. Quickly read the papers associated with the panel. So clearly the panelists should read the paper carefully. The other just skim the paper and define at least two questions to be reported at the, at the end of the slides prepared for the panelists to roll. So you will need to prepare slides. Three slides when you are acting as panelist with your position and one ladder slide or more with the question you would like to ask to the other panel hmm, when you are acting as an audience. And at the end of both panel, you will also have the time to revise the slides if needed and submit them for delivery because this is one exercise for the exam. So the slides need as material to prove that you have done the exercise. And also you need to, to be there, to be here. So which are the two panels? Panel one, artificial intelligence versus intelligent augmentation. There are two papers to read. These are the link to PDF in a free format, so without any on personal website of someone, of the authors, for instance. So you can download them everywhere, from everywhere. And the goal of this panel is to explain which, whether artificial intelligence, so automation or augmentation, has greater relevance today and what is your position onto this different line of thought. And you can also make use of examples. So three slides about this. Uh, the panelists will be everybody with surname between Hamadi and Anastasi. So B, C, D, everybody else. And everybody from Papikyo to, the, to Zhang will be the audience. Hmm? So Hamadi to Anastasi will need to read this paper, create three slides, and 9 to 10 a.m. be panelists for the first panel. Everybody else will work as an audience. So at the end of the presentation, they will have question for them. And as you can imagine, we switch roles for the second panel. So for the second panel, panelists are Papikyo to Zhang, and everybody else is audience. So Papikyo to Zhang needs to read these other two papers. Again, PDF direct. And this is about the role of understandability that is some sort of connected to explainability in interactive AI system. Um, so, and here the goal is express your opinion on which other dimension features in addition to what the author said are important to improve the human AI interaction, starting from these two cases and the decision process through understandability of what's going on. And these are two examples, one on music recommendation and one on medical decision making. So two different fields, but still something to understand and communicate to people. And here, panelists, again, three slides, and then they have the question for the other panel and vice versa. This is the audience. At the end of the panel, you can convert the slide deck you created. So three slides for your panel plus any slides you need for the question in PDF with that sort of template of naming and upload it to this address. And being here connected or in presence and doing the panel plus submitting the PDF is what uh, a, a non-empty PDF is what um, is what needs for uh, succeed in the first exercise. Okay? Any question about this? Is it everything clear? So each, oh sorry. <laughs> so each panelist will talk about two, three minutes, right? Two, three minutes each, yes. And then if the person received question, oh, okay. need to reply. As you like. Don't write font 10 because otherwise it will not be three slides, it will be like three books, but um, a reasonable set of slides, whatever template you want. As panelists, uh, do we choose the problem in the first slide or is this done by the moderator? 
Uh, I will read basically sort of this at the beginning of the panel. Um, the slides, we are not projecting the slides because otherwise we will lose one minute to connect every computer. And then, so you can use the slides on your computer if you want as, as a reference for yourself, but you will speak without any uh, support here, public visible here. So you can write in those three slides whatever you need also for, for presenting and making your point. Okay, so if uh, all the people that did, um, so you are 35 enrolled, but not 35 people did the Madness session. So if we count the Madness session, I imagine that would be like 10, 12 people as panelists and more or less the same number as an audience every time. So if you have a couple of minutes, 10 people, a couple of minutes as panelists is 20 minutes. So should be should be fine. So regulate for two, three minutes each. Okay. Any other question or we can call the day and go lunch. Uh, He's preventing us to lunch. <laughs> As an example, you have two, three minutes to speak, so, okay, so not a lot. Speak in two or three yeah, I, well, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I would say um, with a link. So I would say around a link. It's okay. so like one, two, uh, maybe the most significant if you want to support the position. Uh, and then in the slides you can maybe add more if you want, uh, but here clearly you, you wouldn't have time to, to go all, all over them, right? So have a good lunch and see you on Friday, same time, same room. Have a nice rest of the week and afternoon. <laughs>